Hey, Power Athlete Nation. Summer is weeks away, and you got to get that body right. Now, whether it's to pack on a little bit of muscle to fill out those pants and fill out that T-shirt, or to lean out and show off those abs by popping off that shirt, we got you covered. Now, the reason we like to start busting our ass now is so that we have a little bit of margin of error so that you can cut loose and not feel guilty. So what I want you to do is go check out one of Power Athletes' nutrition protocols. We got a leaning, we got a bulking, we got a keto, and we also have a performance protocol for those of you that need a little bit of extra attention or really trying to dial it in so that you look like a million bucks come summer. To learn more, head to powerathletehq.com forward slash nutrition to find out which protocol is right for you. And we're going to give you an extra 20% off at checkout with the code Eat the Week. 20%? Yeah, that's all caps. E A T T H E W E A K at checkout. Dude, sounds good to me. Now you got your mission. You know what we're expecting. Go get it. See ya. Well, thanks for uh, joining us on an episode of Power Athlete Radio. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. It's always good to have people local coming in, and it's always fun to do them in person. So much so. So we got Kyle Hartzell, professional lacrosse player and head coach at the University of Texas men's lacrosse program. Yeah. Just got down here, moved down here in October. So I was in Park City, Utah, living out in L.A., pandemic hit, and I pretty much was like, I get the hell out of here. So I was out there helping launch the PLL, helping them get off the ground. Um, and then when the pandemic hit Park City, and then I got a job over here and got packed my car and came right to Austin. So. Nice. <laughs> Excellent move. So shout out to Marcus Holman, and thank you for connecting us. And we're going to get into PLL, coaching, a lot of things. Nice. And we actually played against the, each other in college. So oh, we got it. another D3 all-star here, John. Does he actually do, – do, do you remember him? No, oh, fuck no, dude. What school? What school? Marymount University. Oh, the, Marymount. We used to beat the show, you guys. Oh, yeah. I don't even want to get into the score. <laughs> He's like, uh, so I, I had the uh, opportunity. I played in the NFL for a decade. Yep. And uh, I'll come across people be like, oh, yeah, no, uh, we totally played you guys. And I'm like, I don't fucking know who you are. <laughs> and they were like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's even worse because Salisbury talk about national champions every year. And then we were just. Any connection to the stake? Mm. That's a question for Kyle. It is, it is not. No, it's often confused with it, but no, steak has nothing to do with it. Yeah, I, I, I played for the Eagles and yep. uh, lived in Philly and uh, Salisbury steak and fucking shit on a shingle Cheap and meat. all those just ridiculous diner foods were just awful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that whole East Coast thing. But they do have cool diners. Yeah. So from Maryland originally. Yeah, from Baltimore. Born and raised in a town called Dundalk, um, just outside the city of Baltimore. Um, but yeah, I was born and raised. Good, I was a soccer player growing up and then um, got into lacrosse in high school. So I was like a late bloomer, uh, late getting into the sport my ninth grade year. And I was like, this sport is really awesome and I want to play this in college. So I kind of worked my ass off at it um, and decided to play lacrosse in college over um, high school or over soccer, but I did, wasn't very good coming out of high school. So I went to community college first, had to take that route because I got no offer, literally could go nowhere from there. So I went to Essex community or Villa Julie college for one year when it was Villa oh, Julie, now not, Stevenson. Yeah, Stevenson. That program was so poorly ran when I went there. And then Canabine had actually come in that year. And then he, if he was there, I probably would have stayed because he did a great job. They won yeah. a national championship. And then um, from there, I went to Essex community college and then. Uh, Salisbury was at one of my games and said, hey, you should try to walk on. And walk on, made the team, and the rest is history from yeah. uh, the college standpoint. They totally sold you. You can have all the steaks you want yeah. <laughs> well, they, as long as they're Salisbury steaks. <laughs> they sell a lot of kids. So it, it's like the, the transfer portal school. So you yep. get a lot of kids that maybe didn't make it in D1 or you know they're the, the I guess, second tier. I'd put D3 above D2. Yeah. Maybe you can co-sign that, but <laughs> in lacrosse anyways. But they, they pull a lot in. So even walking on that team, that's not an easy task. No, it's not. We had 90, there was like 98 kids trying out um, that walk on there and half of them get cut like the first hour pretty much. He's just like cutting the kids as they pretty much walk onto the field. He can tell the way they walk pretty much. He's like, you're done, you're done, you're done, you're done. So you got to look yeah. the part. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. See, uh, I don't know shit about lacrosse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Chris gave me this like probably three hour dissertation uh, when we had Marcus um, Holman on, Holman on yeah. uh, about like, the position of the helmet, the hair, the, the entire, like, I don't know, motif Aura. of, like, the outfit and this. And, I, I, I like, he got, like, an hour into it. And I was fucking, it's all about yeah. Panaz, John. Uh, 90-10 is It the reminds me of uh, the DBs in the NFL. So, yeah, we, used to call them basically. The, we used to call them the killer bees because they had this whole, like, outfit and all this other bullshit. And it was just real involved. So, 
But what'd you take? 90, 10, it's 90% of the way you look and 10% of how you play. play. Yeah. That's how I made it in school. <laughs> <laughs> fucking great time is we that, didn't win a lot of games is that what great time. It, like is that like the opening speech you give at ut and you're like hey guys we might not win a lot of games yeah look good though but we're gonna fucking look yeah. good <laughs> and that's all that matters in lacrosse look good play good as they say so yeah, yeah. All look ways. good feel good play good yeah. well even what's what's cooler is even the jump following so your senior year undefeated and national champion yep uh, and then making the jump to pro so like d3 to pro even now, but way back then, even more so, it's not necessarily reality. So what created the possibility in your mind? Yeah, I mean, just, you know, when I was at Salisbury, one of the all-time greats out of there, Eric Martin, two-time USA guy, um, played pro for, I don't know, had over a decade, um, kind of wanted to not not follow his footsteps, but he kind of motivated me to go play pro because not a lot of D3 guys go and play pro. There's only... I think today maybe two guys in there that are still playing D3. So you'll get one one every once in a while coming in. But that really motivated me to play professional lacrosse. I was like, I want to make – one, do it for myself. And two, know that kids are playing D3. It's like you can – anyone can do this at D3 level, D2 level. It doesn't matter what level you're playing at. You just got to put in the work and yeah. you can play at the highest level. Um, mm-hmm. It's all about discipline and working out. I've been blessed with having great trainers um, throughout my whole entire career. Um, and I owe a lot to them because if you have a good trainer that's putting you on a schedule and you're going there schedule pretty much every day. Kobe Bryant had a good quote, like every summer before he went for basketball, he wrote a contract to himself, the training contract he was doing every summer and it was non-negotiable showed up every day. You got to show up every day and you can do anything you want pretty much. <laughs> yeah. The uh, Raph had a pipe pledge that uh, I had to sign at least but I don't know if you had did that you, back in the did day. Did you have to sign it in blood? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, John had a trainer and I went and mentored him following. Yeah. And uh, man, it was a fucking great time. <laughs> yeah, but, no. Um, yeah, no. The guy that trained me when I was in the NFL is a rock star. Yeah. Um, when I moved to Tampa, um, I didn't know anybody. So I called my agent and I was like, hey, is there anybody around here that I can train with? So he shoots me back this guy's number. Hey, I heard this guy works with a bunch of professional baseball players. So I didn't hold that against him. And uh went out and trained with this dude and he was like like we, we were at the UT track stadium and uh Tampa. He, yeah, Tampa. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh University of Tampa uh put me through this track workout uh with PVC and like hurdles and all this shit for like two hours. Broke me the fuck off. Yeah. And I remember thinking, like, dude, if this guy can do this with nothing, wait till we get to the weight room. And uh so I trained with him and I think it was like uh this would have been my second year. We trained the whole off season. I went back. Um I had been, you know, started sixteen games the year before. Came back, killed it, went back another year and, uh, you know, said, hey, I mean, this has been good. Uh, I'm not going to stay here and train with the team. I'm going to go train with my guy. And I remember our birthdays are about a day apart. So I was like, hey, man, I'm going for my birthday. He's like, it's my birthday, too. So we go out. And so, you know, we're sitting there at some sushi restaurant. And I think I'm 20, probably 25. Yeah, I think I might have been 25. So it was my 25th birthday. And his, like, they bring out candles. And he's like 26 or 27. And so he's Filipino. So I didn't know if this dude was like 50 or 14. <laughs> right. And, and I mean, he's out there killing people and there was all these pros training with him and he was only like two years older than me. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck dude, if I had known this guy was this young, I would have never have trained with him. Yeah. But I mean, we had already been in it and he was killing it and he's probably one of the best coaches I've ever been around. Yeah. Yeah. And I've had a bunch of I being mean, Jay Dyer, Marcus with the podcast. <laughs> I had him right out of college and he was, you know, he was, one of the greatest trainers I've ever had. If it wasn't for him, I probably still wouldn't be playing today because he kind of set the, you know, I had the motivation coming out of college, but those workouts that he had were like psychotic. 300 yard shuttles after. Guess. Yeah. Like, can, can you get into the training for lacrosse? Yeah. I mean, is it a kind of a, uh, you know, combination of like football and, and soccer and like, how is the training specific? Yeah, I think, you know, you need to have a good strength conditioning component in it. You don't need to be the biggest guy, depending on the position you play. I mean, you're seeing guys, you know, Marcus Holman, who you talk to, Will Manny. I mean, they're all under – Will's 5'8", I think, maybe 165 pounds. I mean, he's small, but mm-hmm. he's fast and he's quick. I mean, speed kills in lacrosse. So, like, if you're – I spend a lot of time, my speed and agility work – is two times a week and strength conditioning two times a week. We mix it in too as well. The new trainers I have up at the collective in uh, Austin, Tim Riley is my trainer and Jeremy Hills. Um, we work out with a bunch of NFL guys. So I have NFL guys in there I'm working out with. And then uh, Bijan Robinson just joined us last week. Been working out with him. He's an absolute moose of a person. Um, but we, it's, it's all strength conditioning, 
Um, mobility, I've been working a ton into my workouts now from an injury prevention standpoint. I'm getting older, um, so we do a lot of hip mobility. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much a mixture of, I think, everything. Um, we're not kind of focusing on one thing. It's strength conditioning, getting strong, you know, in the squat department, getting our legs strong. Because I play defense, so i got to be able to push guys around, be physical. Um, yeah. So you need to have some strength for that position. Probably defensively more so than anything. You need to be strong physical um and quick so get in the way yeah get in the way but uh yeah a lot of conditioning you know 300 yard shuttles those suck but those are the best thing i use to get to shape on my own pretty much are you doing uh 650s or 50 uh we I do 50 yard increments and then i'll do 30 yard increments um the 30 yard increments beat the shit out of you but the 50 yards you, know, you can strive that a little bit yeah. but the yeah the 30 yard increments are they're tough <laughs> yeah that uh that was our conditioning test in college it was yeah. uh, two 300 yard shuttles separated by like five minutes yeah or it was three minutes or something and i remember we always lobbied for uh 560s over 650s yeah and it was pretty amazing like one year we did it one way and the other way that extra turn adds fucking a completely different element to it crushes you yeah but yeah. did you do that if you're consistent doing those mats like that's one of the best ways to get in shape yeah 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 well the i mean training and I mean, working hard is not synonymous with lacrosse like it is for football. Yeah. So it almost gives you an edge that you have this mentality to outwork everybody. Why is that? Yeah. But you grew up in it. You can tell yeah, me. I mean, I think growing up, you know, I played pro indoor and pro outdoor. Indoors, played the hockey rinks, a lot of fight and stuff. It's kind of like hockey, but on turf. Um, when I got into that league, it was a lot of guys were out of shape. You could just tell the body types. You could tell guys were out of shape. But now you look at the sport, I mean, there are so many freaking athletes playing at every level, whether it's college, professional. Um, the sport is growing so damn fast right now. Um, mm-hmm. It's been the fastest growing sport in America for the past, I don't know, decade probably. And the women, at the, on the women's side, it's grown even, you know, better. But, um, you know, it's, it's just like, I think athletes are realizing how important strength conditioning is. And there's a huge emphasis on that now. Like kids want to get in the gym. They know, you know, if they're following me or any of these other athletes are seeing us in the gym, they're like, shit, I need to work out or I'm not going to be able to play in college. So I think there's way more of an emphasis on, you know, taking care of your body, being strong and working hard in the gym because that all translates onto the field and being successful. So, yeah, it's good. And then now the, the, professionals the dudes that are doing it are showing their training so social media is good in that respect otherwise you had these kids that grew up have coaches that maybe made it to a certain level but didn't train hard and as we know high schoolers do what their coaches do so oh you don't need that i didn't need that so you don't need it well we always go back to when we were at the high school uh, texas high school football association <laughs> conference and we were uh so this is before we moved to texas we were in california yeah we were in california, you were in california. yeah i was in california he was in texas so we get asked to come speak and like uh, have a booth at this deal called Texas High School Coaches Association in San Antonio. So we show up. We're trying Imagine to imagine LaxCon, but for Texas high school football. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what happened was all these high school coaches uh, performance polos with their team, shaved head, goatee. Usually, you know, the only thing they were training for was diabetes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, dude, when I say these dudes were like. I mean, all goatees to hide multiple chins, shaved head, because, you know, if you're a football strength coach, you got to have a shaved head goatee. Yeah. Well, they and weren't they, even strength coaches. No, they these are the football coaches. Yeah. But they all figured out that this was like a pretty good look because it hides the double chin and then, you know, the receding hairline. And they just put on massive amounts of fucking, you know, diabetes. And yeah. uh, we were trying to rap with these dudes like, hey, what are you guys doing for your performance? What are you doing for your strength and conditioning with the kids? Uh, you know, and we either got we're not telling you like we're somehow going to spy upon them. Or uh, we're doing whatever Bear Bryant did. Yeah. And I'm like, so you're going off in 1950s when water made you weak. Yeah. <laughs> and like it was it, it was extremely eye-opening to realize how like locked people are in like the past. And more importantly, this is what we did or this is what I did. So this is for what the kids, you know. Yeah. And I mean, I saw that. I coached. I was down in Dallas for seven years. Coach at Plano West High School. Um, big football school. Um, and then you got Allen right down the street where Kyler Murray played like one of the best high schools in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, but all of our lacrosse athletes were – the football players were our best athletes and our best players. But we wouldn't get them – football is king here, obviously, and they just run the show. So I would never get my football guys until, like, whenever the hell they would let them out of the gym. But every single guy would have a back injury. Shin splints. Shin splints, you name it. And just when I would ask them what their injuries were from, every freaking injury was from the weight room because they go – like, Plano West, we have, like, 
hundreds of squat racks. There's two coaches in there watching them, and yeah. there's 70 kids. Well, and the coaches don't know shit. No. I mean, because uh, and not to, you know, belittle any of these high school individuals. No. But the problem is, is that because uh, they lifted weights at some point and they can coach football, like, oh, you'd be the strength coach. And these guys, um, I mean, they, yeah. just, they just don't have a skill set. I mean, it. you know, I, I, uh, I played offensive line, and even just watching high school coaches try to coach offensive line is painful. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, we had – you know, like I said, I injured my back in college, L4, L5 bulging discs, uh, deadlifting. But at Salisbury, same thing as what I saw in high school was we got our entire team in the weight room. There's one guy in there watching us, and it's a, you know, it's a dick swinging contest. It's like, okay, that guy's got 315. I'm going to do 320. Didn't warm up properly, and that's when I effed my back up. Um, and I just got over that probably like three or four years ago, like no back pain at nice. all. <laughs> so it was uh, – but hurt myself working out from not being – being taught the right way to do it. And I think being me getting hurt was like, okay, I need to like focus on warming up properly and doing all that stuff because we did not focus on that whatsoever. <laughs> no, I mean, there's um, there, there's a really kind of interesting misconception, especially with lifting weights. And if you've had any back injuries, uh, there's a guy named Stu McGill, which we've had on the podcast. He always talks about the idea of like hypermobility being the biggest determining factor for injury, especially lifting weights. So to lift weights, you need a certain level of rigidity. And it's like speed, uh, you know, like people, uh, when we saw this within the CrossFit market where people were hyper mobile, where, cause they were just doing nothing but mobility work and they couldn't necessarily maintain positions and like stay rigid and especially yep. at the end ranges when they needed to be rigid. And so like, there's this interesting balance of like, um, you know, doing mobility work, which is, looks like heavy weight on your back, stretching to full ranges of motion and staying active and then being mobile in certain other ways. And so it's a really interesting concert for individuals, especially when you watch them train, like where are they limiting in mobility? Like in a squat, for example, the biggest one we see is within the ankles, people's yep. ankles, especially uh, if you play the cross or football, they fucking tape the shit out of your ankles. So then you get to this point, your ankles are fucking locked. Then you yeah. go to squat and it's, and it's a motherfucker to try to get any positive dorsiflexion. Yeah. And I stopped taping my ankles. Actually, I used to get my ankles taped every single game, yeah. practice, everything. And it's like a cast. Yeah. They fucking heel stirrups and fucking locks yeah. and heel locks and your fucking ankles are locked. And it's not until like the third quarter when all of a sudden the, the taste uh, or the tape is nice and sweaty and they've loosened up to actually where you feel like, oh shit, I can actually move. And yeah. by that time, the and, tape is worthless. And I had like ankle injuries. I'd roll my ankles all the time, but I would tape my ankles, but I'd roll my ankles playing basketball. And then I stopped taping my ankles. I had not rolled my ankles. So yeah. yeah. So <laughs> yeah, we, so. we had to tape our ankles or we would get uh, fined. Yeah. So I, what I would do is get my ankles taped like three hours early squirt water in them, work them and make sure the shit was nice and loose by the time I went out there. So Cause if matter. not, yeah, yeah, by that time it was, it was useless. Yeah, Cause the next, um, what is it? The next joint up's your knee, right? So if you're too tight at your ankle, yep. if your ankle's going and doesn't go, your knee goes. So yeah. that's another thing I heard. And I was like, okay, I'm going to stop taking my ankles. Yeah. Well, I mean, think, think about it. It usually goes two joints too. Cause if the ankle's locked now, all of a sudden you have hip and knee injuries. Yep. And so, potential. yeah, potential. The, yeah, I broke my ankle, broke my fibula. Uh, freshman year, so 2005, two weeks before we played Salisbury, and did gravy come out for the Salisbury? <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I had to sit out that year. But then for the remainder of my career, taped ankles every single day because I would not let it take me away from the game. But little did I know what I was actually doing, deterring my performance. I have to make up ankle issues for years. Yeah, no, um, man, like the ankle thing is so fascinating. Because you think about like uh, a foot position, especially all the stuff we've been doing with uh, trying to like um, increase strength in the foot. Uh, we had a coach on Cal D to super sharp. And um, his whole deal is that 99 percent, 99.9 percent of our contact with the earth is within the foot. So all the injuries we see within the knee and the hip are from weak feet and collapsing arches and those just lack of mobility, rigid feet. And so basically putting a training program together to make sure your feet are the strongest will alleviate 99 percent of all these issues. And we're, does working out barefoot help? Oh, hell yeah. Uh, I think so. Yeah. yeah. I've been doing that a ton. This, like this year, I haven't, haven't put my shoes on. I've been working out nonstop with my shoes off. Yeah. There was an old uh, podiatrist when I went to the Eagles as a rookie. I, I have high arches. Yeah. And his whole deal was like, hey, man, um, I mean, they're going to make you orthotics today. Or if I cut you a deal and show you how to stretch and, and maintain your feet, uh, I won't make you orthotics. I was like, shit, I'll take option two. Yeah. And then I asked him, like, you know, like, where'd you come up with all this? And uh, his deal was his dad was a podiatrist. And he's like, you don't think that uh, podiatrists actually have always made orthotics, don't you? Yeah. He's like, before they had to teach people how to take care of their feet, people are fucking lazy. I just make them orthotics yeah, now. Take a pill. Yeah. Yeah. And so he showed me how to like uh, mobilize my feet. And then he's like, I don't want you to wear shoes. 
Uh, the only time I want you to wear shoes is if you're putting on football cleats. So yeah. in the off season, I mean, we still don't wear shoes in our house. I walk around barefoot all the time and I just haven't had any foot injuries since then. So. Yeah. Same with me. I haven't had, I used to roll my ankles all the time and I have not, I don't think I've rolled my ankle in shit, six, maybe 10 years. I've rolled my ankle, knock on wood. Yeah, knock on wood. <laughs> So what what other injuries are pretty common? Is it uh, mainly ankles, knees, hips, backs, I mean, shoulders in lacrosse, or is it just kind of like football where it's just a, a crapshoot on what gets people? There's a bunch of different ones, but I would say if I had to say one injury, it's ACL. I mean, knee injuries are pretty prevalent because the quick, violent, cutting nature of the sport, change of direction. Um, if I was watching the NCAA tournament this past weekend, I probably saw there was three knee injuries. Kids went down. You could just see their knees just like buckle. Um yeah, it's a pretty violent sport via the change of direction department. So there's a lot of knee injuries. Is there a lot of hitting into the head? Yeah, there's a lot of hit. There's hitting in the head. I mean, not as much as football. I mean, I think my entire career I've maybe had three concussions. Um, it's there. Um, the pro level, not really because the ball is in, the, in our sticks the entire time. Usually when the injuries or the head injuries come is when the ball's in the ground, ground ball scrumming guys are killing each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but the pro game, I, I mean – I'd say maybe one or two every season, but like it's not, I don't think it's like a prevalent thing. Because guys are so proficient with it. Yeah. I mean, proficient with it. And like if a guy, I mean, I know I, if a guy is like in the air and the ball, I'm able to get the ball first. A lot of guys don't do that. They just hit the guy. I, I'm, I'd rather get the ball and go on the field and put it in the back of the net. Um, so there are some meatheads out there that want to hit people and kill them, which is great. I think it's good for the sport. Um, but uh, yeah. So how does this work? Um, you're, you're coaching the lacrosse team, which is, uh, is it an NCAA or is it still a club? It's MCLA. So when I took the job back in um, September, um, they've had, they've tried to take it division one. Um, they've come short with the money. You need pretty much like $22 million. Um, and much, Shit, that's yeah. fucking money hiding <laughs> in the fucking Texas couch. I know. You're, you're like, go in there and look at the yeah. 80s couch. He's got $22 million hiding up in that bitch. Uh, I do got a, a funny antidote. So I interned for a strength uh, university football team 2013. So the summer of 13 and brought lacrosse sticks to, I mean, we had the middle of the day off when it's hot as all hell. So brought two lacrosse sticks and just playing catch with another intern on DK Royal Stadium. And we're just having fun, running around, and somebody comes down from the office, and it was like, excuse me. we polite. We're just, yes, sir, can we help you? He's like, what are you guys doing? And I was like, oh, lacrosse, played in school, we're interns for the football team. And he's like, well, this is not a place for games. I need you to put that away. Yeah. I was like, well, yes, it is. I didn't uh, say that. Yes. But. No, it literally is a place <laughs> for games. Yeah. So we have our two, I mean, one of our donors, Scott Cavan, um, he donated the field. So we have one of the only MCLA schools with our own facilities. We have our own. What's MCLA? MCLA is Men's College Across Association. So okay. it's Division One, but men's club. So it's not as serious as NCAA. I don't have to follow the NCAA guidelines. I can talk to kids, recruit, whatever I want. Well, fuck. I mean, the NCAA, or sorry, NCAA assholes just uh, imploded <laughs> themselves with <laughs> yeah. this NIL deal. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, they fucking opened a, a Pandora's box oh, yeah. that I don't think they're going to survive. No. And I think with that, they need to, I think each team needs to have a manager and they need to have like a, I call it like a salary cap because yeah. some of these NIL deals these kids are signing. Oh, my God. Because Bijan, he works out with us. He pulls up in a Lamborghini. He just signed a deal with Lamborghini. They gave him a Lamborghini, and I, I don't know how much that deal is worth. But is, is, is he a UT player? a college guy? Bijan, yeah. He's the Heisman, he's the Heisman front runner. I mean, one of the Heisman front runners. He's got a Lambo. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Good but, for uh, him. Fucking good for him. Yeah. But, I mean, some of these kids, the thing I like about it, like some of the kids that do get these deals, the situations they come from, like they can take care of their families and – it's good, but they, it needs to be managed, I think, in some in well, some aspects. Master P's son got two mil before he played a game. So what's wild is that the um, uh, the donors are putting together these like uh, investment groups, and now they're raising money to go out and legally pay these kids yeah. and sign them to these deals. So it's just actually they legalized. I mean, shit, they, they gave, uh, what was it? SMU was the fucking death nail. Yeah. I mean, they're doing exactly what, what they SMU would. SMU did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, like Bruce Smith. Yeah, you know, I mean, oh, Reggie Bush. Oh, dude, I mean, Bruce got paid, and I know because I, I was fortunate or fortunate to play against Bruce and then hang out with him. And I asked him, and he's like, oh, "I was fucking great in college. They fucking Bruce. where did he go to school? SMU, SMU. I did not know that. Yeah, he was one of the yeah the whole death nail dude. <laughs> yeah, good yeah. for him. Oh yeah, yeah. It's hold on, let me pull this one up. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, uh, what would a Salisbury nil deal? It's like Natty Light. What natty light, yeah, probably Natty Light and Salisbury <laughs> steak. You know, oh, uh, banquet, dollar <laughs> banquet dinners. But yeah, the, the, we get back to the question: the MCLA um, 
it's not official college, and the kids that play MCLA didn't want to go play. Oh, I'm sorry. Bruce Smith was Virginia Tech. Fuck, I'm sorry. It was bad. <laughs> yeah, but no, but he did get paid in college. <laughs> but they're uh, not official. A lot of the kids I talk to don't want to go play D1. I got a couple of D1 transfers coming in, and they're just like, hey, like I just don't want the constraints of Division One lacrosse, and I get it. Like They got their social lives and – their, their workload, and then they feel – some of them feel like they don't have a life. I mean, at Salisbury, 6 a.m. workouts, go to class all day, practice, and then that was it in the spring. That's all I did with my full-time job. But, like, I like that. And mm-hmm. some people do. Some people don't. And I think NCLA is a good balance. Like, we're pretty serious at Texas. I, I'm trying to – you know, I changed the culture. As soon as I stepped in, we beat the number one team in the country this year. So, um, biggest Which winner. is who, – who's B- number? BYU. Oh, is BYU the biggest? Huh? Yeah. It's kind of unfair. You know, they're, um, they got wife, kids. Some of them are 26. They don't drink. They don't do anything. And it's like, but they're, they're unbelievable. Across yeah. The <laughs> but they, they do it in other ways. Yeah. Uh, have you ever seen those, uh, the fucking Mormon slim and energy drinks? I mean, <laughs> no. like, uh, Cokes and energy drinks is like, they're fucking, uh, like they're, yeah. Uh, it's they're yeah. Oh yeah, dude. Well, I mean, you know, people got to do something. Yeah. You know? But they're, I mean, can't say enough, enough about them. But, yeah, we beat them this year. We went up there to BYU, beat them. That was a pretty big win. And kids kind of saw that, you know, they can do anything. And, you know, we're getting the right pieces in place. And we're all sophomores. So we'll be back next year for sure. No. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you actively go out and play with the uh, the players? Keep your skills shot? Uh, no. I mean, this this year I was going to. I was going to suit up a little bit, but I had a posterior tib tear of toe flexor muscles. Um, did it training, and I'm just getting getting back from that. So, no, I didn't do that this year. Oh. <laughs> you, do you well, give a lot of like, hey, don't make me come out here and fucking whoop your guys out? <laughs> no, I don't do. I'm pretty – I stay at home. If a kid calls me out, then I'll, I'll come bring my shit and then put him in his place. But <laughs> that hasn't happened this year. So Nice. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Just waiting for some asshole to be like, you don't know who the fuck I am? Yeah. <laughs> God damn you. <laughs> so what's the, the goal with the program? To continue to build it, to be number one? I think it's to build it, but like another reason I took the job was with the potential of taking a division one. If Utah or if, it, if Texas were to go division one, so if they went division one next year, it would be the easiest school to recruit to. The, these kids that go to your Syracuse's and your Johns Hopkins, you know, I lived in Baltimore. Johns Hopkins is a prestigious school, good lacrosse school, but you take them to a UT football game, take them down to, you know, Rainy Street. I mean, they're Sixth Street. And yeah, all they're, that. they're not, they're not going to Johns Hopkins. They're going to oh, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> That's why, well, I mean, they're going to do to lacrosse what happened to football. Just fuck the entire program up yeah. by having these kids show up and think that the, <laughs> I fucking made it to the NFL. I got to UT and then they all fucking bomb. Yeah. Hope they turn around this year. I went to two games last year. They lost both of them. I went to the Red River. You better game. stay away, dude. Yeah, so dude, I, like, I, uh, I was like, I got to get out of there. I stopped going. Dude, uh, I played with uh, several and against dudes that went to UT, and it was pretty universally known that the guys at UT were just fucking going to be washed out in the NFL. Yeah. And it was like, well, dude, they already made it to the NFL when they got to UT. And it was just kind of this weird misconception that, uh, you know, UT was the highest level, and just very few of those guys actually panned out. I mean, I think, uh, 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 DJ Derek Johnson was about the only guy I played with who actually panned out. Yeah. And uh, they were talking about what a beast he was. I never even thought he lifted weights. So, but he was a hell of a player. So, yeah. yeah no, I mean, hopefully, uh, hopefully you can uh, keep his kids from getting infected with that shit. Yeah. I mean, we're the lacrosse program is pretty, I mean, we're pretty humble down there. So, um, obviously, we're not part of the school, but um, we're taken care of from you know, our donors and our alumni with good backing. And, you know, I'm excited for. Next year, you know, year one was kind of like, what do we have? And then next year, we know what we have. So, um, yeah, we're going to do some damage next year. For did, sure. did you build your coaching staff? Like, what was that process like? Yeah, I mean, um, Pat Brennan, he's a West Point guy, uh, played at West Point, um, lives here in Austin. Um, he was here before, so I kind of kept him on. He's he's great. I mean, he's a great lacrosse mind and um, mo- great motivator. Obviously, having the Army background, he gives us that structure and – He's very good at talking to kids. We had some issues with kids having some mental issues and some problems. And he's very good at talking to kids and keeping them in line and giving them kind of a guidance and structure. And he, he's a good guy to have. Eric Brassler uh, played at Rochester Institute of Technology, RIT, your national yeah. championship D3 last year. Um, he's also – he runs the offense. I, I run the defense. But those two are a great tandem, and they've done an unbelievable job uh, at UT. So, yeah, we're gonna, they'll, they'll be there for years to come, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. We're talking about coaching versus playing. Like, where do you pull your coaching influences from? Previous coaches that you've had or philosophies, books, things you've stumbled upon throughout your journey? I'm a big, I mean, I do read some books. I don't read a ton, but I'm a big, like, learn from people guy. Um, John Donowski, uh, he's my Team USA coach. He's probably one of the best coaches I've ever had next to Jim Berkman, who's at Salisbury. 
uh, Coach Berkman, I learned a ton from. I mean, his leadership style and skills are just, you know, I've taken, obviously, you know, similar to your dad raising you, you kind of learn from them. That's what they were. They're pretty much like fathers to us and like teach us how to one, be leaders, be men, be good people, character, um, and the rest takes care of itself. But John Donowski and Coach Berkman are two that stand out. Um, coach Nat St. Laurent, my pro coach, he's another, he's an uh, ex-military guy, well-structured. Um, and I learned a ton from him as well as my second year with him. But I kind of, you know, stayed in touch with him when I, he wasn't my coach. Um, but yeah, he's he's a great leader, great mentor, and I'm glad to have him as my pro coach. So, yeah. What do you think, like, um, you know, uh, for the kids coming out of high school, like what's the limiting factor for them coming in college and being dominant? Is it size, strength, speed? Is it skill? Like where – like what sets the bar? Like what, you know, like when you talk about like the cutoff, when a kid comes and shows up, like yeah. what's the difference? Um, I think it's depending on the position too, but like, I think speed and size is very important because if you're stronger, if you're bigger, faster, stronger than everyone, you're obviously an asset to have on the field, the skill piece, right? If you're getting recruited, you still have, you got to have some skill. Some kids do have raw stick skills. Obviously a big hand eye coordination sport. You're catching this ball on a stick. Um, you can work on that, right? If you bring him in as a freshman, you work with him all year. He gets to learn from the other players in front of him. I think by year two, he's going to be a, a force of you know force to be reckoned with. If you have all the skill in the world, but you can't run fast and beat guys, then I mean you're useless. I think for, from a I mean if you can cradle and shoot the ball 100 miles an hour, but you can't beat your man in front of you, I mean you're not going to get on the field. So it sounds day. like uh, big, strong athletes that are able to move in space. You can kind of like take that individual as long as they have some semblance of skill. You can teach him some of the, the yeah. stick handling. We got a kid coming in, uh, Caleb Eby. He's St. Anthony or St. Michael's kid. He, he um, he's six, five, 250 pounds, not overly quick, but he'll get to wherever the hell he wants. Cause he's just going to put his shoulder down, mm-hmm. lean in, get there and he'll have a shot. So, um, that's another thing. If you're not that fast, if you're bigger than everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so a kid like this who, you know, uh, like obviously played football, He's a bad, big basketball player. I don't think he played football. Oh, wow. Big basketball player, well, yeah. It's, it's interesting. The, the, there's, so much, yeah. <laughs> there's so much – There's so much – 6'6". Yeah, Yeah, there's so much you, different you ain't sports. Going anywhere. There's so many different sports in lacrosse. This yes. is one of the conversation pieces I want to get into. Like basketball translates better uh, like to offense because it's the same rotations, formations, and really leaning into people without overpowering them. And then defensive side, that's like playing offensive line in football. You're protecting this little man in the goal versus the little man throwing the ball. And you're pushing and shoving posture position and not getting beat one way or another. So there's so many different sports into this. And, I mean, how important is it that these athletes have exposure to many different sports growing up versus just lacrosse? I mean, I think, you know, athletes nowadays, lacrosse especially, one of the things I hate about the sport is it's become so specialized and full-time. Like when I was in, when I was in high school, I played soccer, basketball. Literally, I played every single sport under the sun. And it's called a uh, uh, sport periodization, yeah. where you're periodizing through sports, so you're not like just playing baseball, fucking ten, twelve, yeah. you know, months a year. Yeah, but I think you know you're seeing the sport become more specialized, and I actually kind of makes me sick to my stomach because a lot of these programs charge you know six thousand dollars for the summer. Jesus couple thousand dollars for this fall and they're making hand over fist money. And then my company, I'm, you know, I just travel, train kids, the position, teach them that. And some parents are just like, can't afford it. We're paying this. I'm like, you know, why are you paying 10 grand for, you know, lacrosse and they're not teaching. Then a lot of them don't teach the kids shit. And yeah. that's the thing that drives me insane. But there are good programs that, you know, they charge the money, but the kids are getting better and they are doing it the right way. But sometimes they just roll the ball out. They're paying the money roll the ball out and they go play. They don't teach anything. And it's just, yeah, you know. it's like the AAU model from basketball where it's yeah. just games performances versus like a, a clinic or a camp in which you're focused on the skills yeah. and then the opportunity to piece it in the game. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, I do. I, uh, uh, I have twin daughters that are 10 and my little boy is six. And what drives me crazy with all this sporting stuff we do is all they want to do is play games. Yeah. And so a big thing for me is I'm like, what about skill development? So if there's like a skills camp or if there's some like summer deal we can go to, which is all skills, uh, I'll put them in that over actually going on traveling teams. Yeah. And I, I ran a club right out of college. I started a club program. It's called Rogue Lacrosse. My buddy still runs it in upstate, but I did it for three years. And I was like, I got to get the hell out of this thing. I can't do it anymore because the unreal is the expectations of the parents were so unreal. It was just like, okay, we're paying you $5,000. 
Yeah, I need why you to he, guarantee a scholarship. Why isn't he Texas going? Parents, dude. Why isn't he going to Cornell? This it's like your kid. Wow. Your kid can't. Your kid can't chew gum and walk at the same time. Like, you got to get into Cornell. Also, first. you paying uh, me five. You paying me five grand. When we have practice two days a week, he's not picking. I know for a fact he's not picking his stick up on those off days and doing anything on his own. Like the, the guys that make it to the next level are the guys that they'll pay that money to play on that club team. But when practice ends, they're going home. They're on the yeah. wall. They're they're practicing, and those are the kids that make it. Yeah. You think it's because the parents never had any success in athleticism, so they think that there's like this mythical wage to buy your way into it? I, I think some of them, you know, I do think that. I think some parents just don't get it that they didn't play. If you didn't play competitive sports at a high level, like you, you played in the NFL, you obviously did something, worked your ass off to get to that level. Um, yeah, you just don't look into that one. <laughs> you just uh, don't walk into the NFL. No, yeah. I mean, uh, there's some dudes out there that do. Gifted, though. Like, uh, yeah. well, they yeah, don't at, stay yeah. there. Yeah. No, I mean, like, and I was trying to explain this to somebody, if the only reason you're out there is playing for the money, uh, yeah. you get washed out real quick. Oh, yeah. Like, you got to be have, like, pride about you, and there's, yeah. like, a whole bunch of uh, skills, but also, like, mindset and commitment and, and also just a shit ton of luck. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I played with guys that were probably better than me, but just were extremely unlucky with injuries. Uh, shit. I was, I was telling, I was trying to explain this to my daughters so that I played with a dude in high school who was a phenomenal player. Um, the fortunate, uh, the unfortunate thing is he was kind of good looking and he ended up <laughs> dating this girl who was an absolute fucking 12 in high school. Uh, like, like she was the type of girl girls where like, girls will get you in trouble. like 30 year old dudes were dropping her off in a, in a Ferrari when she yeah. was like 16. And uh, he somehow hooks up with this girl and her parents didn't get home till like five o'clock in the afternoon and like football practice. Like, so he was like, basically I can go home and have sex with this girl and dish football practice is what he selected, which uh, I can't say put in the same situation. I wouldn't have done the exact same and I'd have got a chance to play in the NFL. Thank God. I, she, he was way better looking than me. Yeah. And uh, I remember as like, I, I got scholarships and uh, I got like a hundred scholarship offers ended up going to Berkeley. And um, I remember he was in my class and he's like, you're going to Berkeley on a football scholarship. And I'm like, yeah, you could have gone. He's like, yeah, I totally fucked that one up. <laughs> but he's like, but it was great. And uh, yeah, so uh, like there's a lot of like just yeah. pitfalls that dudes run into. And I think, that, you know, the parents, I think one, the parents, if they didn't play competitive sports, they don't know that background. They are like, okay, I'm paying you this money. Why isn't my kid the best lacrosse player on the field? Um, and there's just, I, I think in the whole sport of lacrosse, this might be across all sports. There's a lot of unreal expectations. It's like, okay, you're – the best coach in the world. Why is he not playing in the NFL? Why is he not playing in the PLL? Like there's a lot of that. And you know, I got out of that because I couldn't handle that shit because they're, they're paying me. Now I do clinics. It's like, Hey, I'm, I got a clinic this weekend. Marcus is actually coming down for you. gets here Friday. Um, but we're going to Houston on Saturday to coach a bunch of kids. And then Sunday we're here in Austin coaching a bunch of kids. And oh. it's like, Hey, you shit, guys- dude, that's a bummer. We're out of here, man. I would like to meet him in person. Yeah. We should have gone out and drink with those guys. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, I, that. I fucking, Next time. I heard that lacrosse guys can't drink for shit. Oh no. Maybe not, not Marcus. Uh, Marcus, yeah. I've, uh, Marcus's bachelor party was in Vegas uh, a couple months ago. We, we're just fine. You know, uh, I heard like two, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like two near beers and a fucking face plant was him. Oh. Isn't that what he told us that he can't drink? Or Marcus? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sounds about right. Yeah. Sorry, dude. <laughs> Marcus. He, I think he's giving you guys. He's, he's set the bar really low. So when he goes out with you, he's like, "You're like, holy shit, this guy can drink." Yeah. Which is me. I, I have like one. Like, so uh, I'm the world's worst drinker. Uh, I have like a drink and get bombed off of one drink, which is perfect because uh, like my days of fucking sitting there and fucking slinging and back till yeah, three. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's yeah fuck, yeah, I can't. That's do over it. with. Yeah. As I've gotten older, that's getting less and less. I'm like maybe. I go out maybe twice a month. I'll have casual drinks on the weekend, but yeah, it's, those days are over. <laughs> so the uh, uh, so like uh, we deleted our direct TV because uh, I just got fucking tired of paying for it. So we've been watching like Netflix. Yeah, and uh, there's all these historical shows, and we were talking about them. But like there was like a Vikings one we were watching with my daughter, and like every night these dudes just get fucking smashed. Drinking out of horns. Oh yeah, drinking out of horns. They're fighting and this. Need. And uh, my daughter's like, "Is that what it's really like when you go out and drink?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Yes, only, only if you're lucky." <laughs> If you have friends, and I was like, yeah, there was a time where we used to fucking act like drunk Vikings. And my yeah. daughter's like, yes, you know. So she's 10 years old, and I could see it. And she was like, when can I start drinking? Never. Because they, they got kids in there. Because, like, their little kids are, like, giving them drinks, and the kids are fucking falling over. And I was like, um, when you're 16, we'll go to Germany and Oktoberfest, and you can fucking drink as much as yeah. you want. And then you'll Which see. Which is not going to be a lot. No, no, dude. We saw when we were uh, a couple years ago, we uh, taught a seminar in Nuremberg, and then we went to Oktoberfest, and we show up. And um, like I don't know if you've been, but it's these huge fucking tents. 
like imagine beer, like beer fest. I've been to an Oktoberfest in this country, okay. not in not no in, in, in Munich, right? So <laughs> it's on the parade grounds in Munich, where like you know Hitler wa- like marched with yep. the fucking you know SS and shit. And um, there are these huge like tents, like and they got like six polka bands. I mean, they're three football field tents. And so we walk in with Chris, and he's like, "Hey, where are we going to go?" I'm like, "Just." hang out for a second he's a little nervous all of a sudden i see these fucking idiots shatter a glass and start fighting i'm like those are our people so we walk over come to find out that they're like americans and canadian uh, hockey players that were playing in europe and just happened to have a game and they came fucking instant fucking buddies we're like ah meatheads doing stupid shit you're our guys and uh we had a great fucking time yeah yes yeah yes we we did i mean so they bring these uh these beers that were like 20 euro a beer I mean, they had to be fucking 40, 50 ounce fucking mugs. These Steiner mugs? Yeah, yeah just yeah. fucking smashing it. We yeah. had a uh, we had a good time. We were in Prague and doing that. We thought they were Steiner mugs, ones you can like clang together. No. We did that. Shattered. I was like, oh, that's not one of those. Yeah, no, I actually have a picture of us fucking, <laughs> and they were all broken. And we're like, oh, yeah. more beers. <laughs> <laughs> fucking great I, I i tell my kids i'm like man my uh i would love to go back but i want to bring them and we got to wear the traditional leader hose and the full outfits and then fucking i want to see them get not that i want to see my kids drunk but uh, i think it'd be funny to like i remember my first beer yeah, <laughs> yeah the documentary beer fest yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh in high school so soccer up uh, on the east coast is a fall sport yep. in texas is a spring sport because nothing competes with football yeah but and then you basketball into lacrosse. Was there any time for weightlifting back then? Um, I didn't really get into weightlifting. We had a there was like a high school class weightlifting in high school. I didn't really did not get into my weightlifting until I got to college. Pretty much my my freshman year, my buddy Dan, he's uh he joined the special forces right after college. He's still serving today. He's thirty shit. He's thirty seven. Still serving. Um, How old are you? I'm thirty six. I'll be okay. thirty seven in October. Um. I learned my work ethic pretty much from him. I got to Essex Community College. I met him there, and he was just always at the track. He was running with those damn calf platform shoes. Just oh, uh, just a complete psycho. <sighs> you know those things path. fucking destroy oh, people's for shit. Oh, splints. my God. Yeah. Crush you. I did it one time. I was like, oh, what are these? He's like, try them. I go around the track once. I could not walk for like three days yeah. after that. Yeah. Could no. not walk. There was a kid in basketball who's a pretty decent basketball player. Uh, when we were in high school, had those, and he used to walk around with them. And uh, all he gave himself was like the worst shin splints and actually yeah. missed an entire season because he couldn't even fucking like yeah. bend. Yeah, it was awful. Yeah. But I learned my work ethic from him. He was a gym rat and I kind of like connected myself with him. And that's pretty much where I got my work ethic from. And then from there, I've kind of just been an animal in the weight room. Just I'm in there all the time. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, where would you recommend now? I mean, you get 18 year olds. Do they come with barbell experience? I don't think so. No, none of them. So I mean, where, where do you push them to begin? Um, I mean, we have, you know, back home, uh, Jay's very good at introducing the movements, barbell movements with like pretty much no weight on the barbell. Once they can show you that they can, you know, squat properly without having their back in a compromising position. And I think just teaching kids on a barbell how to do it. Um, you can't just throw a kid under a bar with 145 under there. He's just going to probably F himself up. Um, but you got to teach it. I mean, I think it's very undertaught. I, you know, I've pretty much invested a lot of my time paying, you know, trainers and being with trainers. Cause I trust a trainer to put me through a workout. It's very hard to go into the weight room yourself without anybody. And well, or, or, or at least a training partner. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, shit, when I, um, uh, when I left Raphael and I went and moved back to California, I paid these bodybuilders to be my workout partners yeah. actually just to wreck my weights. Cause, <laughs> cause I mean, dude, it, one, you got to find somebody who's competitive and stronger, a little bit better than you. Or you're just always fucking leading the pack, which fucking sucks. Yeah. And just like them laying out a plan for you. Like Monday I show up. I know it's a lower body day. We're going to run a shit ton of sprints. And Tuesday it's upper body. We're going to smash upper body. Wednesday's off. Thursday pretty much same as Monday. A little different obviously. But um, I just like having that person in the gym motivating me. Because if you're there by yourself, like people calling your cell phone, texting, you're on your phone, looking at Instagram, whatever the hell you're doing. I get very sidetracked when I'm by myself. I still get the workout done, but when I'm with my trainer, it's like the phone's away. I'm dialed in and yeah, I, I love having training. And I think more kids, like I'd rather have, you know, if I'm running a club program, I'd rather charge the kids two grand and say, Hey, take the other three grand. Let's go pay these trainers. And mm-hmm. you go to the weight room. Cause this is 90% what's going to get you in college is the being in the right. weight room. And a lot of those coaches don't push that on them. <laughs> like, um, you know, we've used this phrase way too many times on this podcast, but people fail at the margins of their experience. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when you're a sport coach and like, you know, your, your deal is to coach, you know, on the field with technique and that, uh, you know, in the age old one, like, you know, when, uh, 
fucking all you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail yep you know so hey if like you know i'm a sport coach and that's what i have is the skill then it's all you know skill development and uh even with strength and conditioning coaches where you know they might not have a skill development so now oh yeah it's just nothing in the weight room and you know what they need to do is a little bit of both right like they need yeah. to be able to bang weights have a you know periodized strength and conditioning program and then be able to you know not only go out on the field develop their skills but compete and then just fucking play yeah you know like you said like uh going out on the garage door or uh, like against the garage uh door and fucking hitting the ball and being able to catch and move i mean just all, all, all the shit that we did yeah um you know like as i think like whenever people ask me like oh you know how'd you get to play in the nfl i'm like well first of all i had two older brothers and we fucking fought like motherfuckers yeah. <laughs> uh i wanted to lift weights so i could be big and strong to fucking defend myself yeah um you know i boxed and fought i mean like all the skills that i developed uh just so happened to be to translate yeah to translate because it was everything you know pick up basketball like where our bus stop was so with bus stop we crossed the street and where the bus dropped ever and picked everybody up as a cross street from our house so all the kids walked and we would just stop and play pick up basketball in yeah. our driveway and we did that for years i don't see i mean shit <laughs> When I was a kid, we just played like, you know, wiffle ball in the in the streets, basketball, pickup soccer, wherever it was. I don't see kids in the streets playing shit anymore. When you're just driving your car, you see like a basketball hoop, it looks like it has dust on it. Like yeah. they're just probably inside playing Xbox or I don't well, know. Well, fuck man. Like <laughs> I like in and, and here here's the crazy thing too, and I was uh I'm I'm you know, I'm obviously older than you guys. But like uh, when we were growing up, um one, there was nothing on T V. Like, I mean, fuck, it was yeah. just like there were seven channels box, and it yeah. sucked. And so, like, we would turn it on hoping there was something on. And we never knew what was on because we didn't get a TV guide. Like, you know, fucking, there's no, like, uh, um, scrolling thing telling you what's on. You turn it on, you flip through the channels, and we got to fucking turn it off and leave. Yeah. And we'd go out and play. And there were a ton of kids in the neighborhood. So, uh, when I look at my kids having, like, access to Netflix and computers and, like, you know, I mean, we had computers. But, like, what they, we had, like, seven discs you had to put in to play a game. So, like, think about, like, phones. I mean, there's so many distractions. Uh like I was lucky that we were born in a certain time where it didn't have this stuff. Yeah. Whereas now I look at my kids and I'm like, fuck, I don't know if I'd be any different. Yeah. I mean like, dude, like everything they play looks like a lot of fun. Yeah. If I went to the TV and I could watch anything at any point for endless amounts of hours, I might've fucking planted my butt there and fucking watched all of it. Yeah. And I think you're a product of your environment, right? So it's like, there's a lot of technology right now, but it's also a time where there's so much, there's, the positive of it is like, I can jump on YouTube right now on my phone and find a workout. You guys probably, I saw your website. Like there's, you guys have programs. I can buy a program. Like there's a lot of stuff at your fingertips that you can use to your benefit, but there are a lot of distractions. Yep. (laughs) Oh, fuck dude. I, I, uh, man, uh, I think about this way too much and I'm like, man, I don't know how you guys are going to succeed with as many distractions (laughs) and fucking pitfalls as there are. (laughs) I mean, like it's in it, like, like just, um, uh, this one blows my mind, uh, like access to porn. Yeah. Like, like I, I remember two, in two seconds. Yeah. Like I remember, uh, like there was like, uh, like we lived like kind of near a big golf course and there was all this parkland. So we had like basically built forts and all this shit. We found like playboy magazines Yeah, that some fucking older kids had left. And like, we were like, that was the only thing, you know, like, <laughs> like that was it. Yeah. <laughs> like now it's like, you know, like fucking whatever you're into is in the click within like, you know, two milliseconds. And like the fucking level of this stuff, it's not like us just like randomly seeing a naked girl. It's like, oh, here's DVD, Whatever you want. Yeah. yeah, DVDA, fucking, I mean, all these crazy things. And you're like, holy shit, dude. And then you hand these kids over a phone uh, because their school is like, well, they need a phone for research. And I'm like, yeah, that's same Google. If you just change it. Yeah, they're it, one type away from. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. And uh, so we, we have a th- something set up. It's an app on my daughter's phones where uh, I basically get to like download a report of everything they do on their entire phone. So it's, it's like good. a fucking mirror. Yeah. And I, I go through it all the time. I mean, I tell them all the time. I'm like, I've seen what you're doing. Yeah. So I fucking, fuck yeah. Yeah. Don't. Uh, and and well, it's, they watch the podcast uh, and they make fun of me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they got a pretty good sense of humor, but uh, they were also amazed by how much YouTube content we have. They're like, God, there's so much YouTube shit for you. And I'm like, dude, and we don't even have, like, we're not even actively fighting for YouTube. So it just, oh man, it's, it's, uh, like, I honestly don't know how these kids are going to make it. Yeah. And I tell them all the time, if I, if I had one wish, it'd be a time machine that could take you back to 1978. Well, I, I'll take the positive note that we got a whole rack of garage gym families out there. Yeah. yeah. So then their kids, they know nothing but, okay, that's, it's normal for my parents to go bang weights in the garage. The lift weights, and then we deliver exactly what to do properly Yep, through the app, Train Heroic. So there is a light at the end of the tunnel through technology, but if they know that fitness, training, hard work is normal, 
then it's fucking weird to do all these other things that we're fearing here. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, one thing I'm going to have when I build my house is it's going to be, there's going to be a weight room in there because Ooh, uh, the pandemic. So you got a house here or what's the deal? No, me and my girlfriend are looking. We don't know if I'm going to live here at Park City, Utah. So I came from Park Park City's. I don't know if you guys have been there. Yeah. Many times. Park City's. Uh, I did 89 days snowboarding last year. So this year I did oh. one. So <laughs> I do miss that. Uh, no, I, I do. I, I grew up in California. <laughs> okay. And so, like, uh, you know, fucking, uh, we had LA Sun and Ski Tours every weekend, yep. uh, which we went, went to different places. And, um, man, like, uh, my parents bought a place in Mammoth in about, like, 1970. Yeah, I used to go to, I used to surf in the morning and then go to Mammoth when I lived in Manhattan Beach. Yep. Like, so, I, yeah. So, I grew up in Palos Verdes. Okay. No, yeah. That's, that's yeah. Redondo dude. and then Palos Verdes I, I, right there. Yeah, no, I'm fucking, <laughs> dude, I, I grew up there. I mean, yeah. so, you know, uh, the yard off yep. of, yeah. Yep. So, dude, I, I helped Eric Troll move into that place. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah, yeah no, dude. I've, Barnacles, I've, I'd spend a lot of time in that place down there at the bar. Um, but Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, I lived there. That's where I was in LA. Then pandemic hit, I got out of there, but yeah. that was a good town. Oh, yeah. No, I, dude, I, I grew up there. All my friends still live there. But um, yeah, we, we lived in, um, I grew up in PV. Okay. And then my brother uh, was was a DA in Orange County, so I moved to Newport Beach. Gotcha. And so then uh, five years ago, we had an unsolicited offer, got the fuck out of here and moved here, and now we got a ranch. Yeah. But yeah, I like had... <sighs> The gym thing is like, you know, during the pandemic, when it hit, we were so locked down. I was like, I stole a rower from my trainer, the ski or the, whatever yeah. the hell it is. The C2? Rower? Yeah, C2. C2. Lockdown? You guys didn't have access to your own private gym? <laughs> no, we did not. We California, still had this. Like, Angeles, nothing changed. Yeah, <laughs> nothing here, but LA, it was like, we couldn't even go to the damn beach to surf. They're like, yeah, I can't be in the water. Dude. Like, uh, so, one of my buddies from high school shot a video of a dude out there. In the Coast Guard boats? Fucking Coast Guard. Yeah. Case, uh, he, he was out there surfing during the, the pandemic. The waves were so good that day. I remember the exact day. By himself. Yeah. And he's out there and they fucking Coast Guard brought in two boats and the cops fucking They're arrested chasing. him. He's like, he's like yeah. going down the line and there's a boat, yeah. Coast Guard boat just following. He's the only guy in the ocean. Yeah. I remember the day, like yeah. the waves were. Yeah, ridiculous. They were ridiculous. Yeah. And he was like, fuck this, I'm not this. <laughs> yeah. And my, yeah, my buddy was, was videoing. That it. was his video that went. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't know if it was his, but there yeah. were several people out there videoing because everybody stuck in their fucking house and ran out there. Like, God damn, we're trying to get arrested. Oh, yeah. And, awesome. and then the best was some, somebody, uh, uh, set up a mannequin in like an outfit and acted like they were fishing to try to like bait them out. And then we're fucking like heckling the cops. <laughs> like it, it's, it's the most ridiculous shit I've yeah, ever seen. Yeah. I could talk about that for 10, 10 years straight, but the, uh, the well, we're going to know about it for fucking decades for yeah. the impact that it had within oh, not only adolescents uh, and kids and but psychological but, but even adults in yeah. terms of like uh, uh alcoholism suicides domestic violence yep. like like my, my brother's still a defense attorney in orange county and he's like man like the amount of dv and amount of crazy shit that happened during the pandemic he's like we're gonna look back and think this was the fucking worst thing that ever happened it's nuts yeah but i had a garage gym i filled up my you know i'm a big backcountry hunter so i like backpacking frames so i filled them all up with sandbags I'm in there doing like squat workouts and whatever the hell I could do inside my garage. But I think, you know, when that pandemic hit, I was like, God damn, it'd be nice to have a garage gym right now. Yeah. <laughs> a functional one with like squat racks in it and stuff. But Yeah. We gave to 3000 some odd people a program we called third monkey, basically two cinder blocks, uh, 80 bag, 80 pound bag of concrete from Hope Depot, 50 bucks of knickknacks oh, wow. and then full training program for them to not lose strength because awesome. everybody was like, Hey, body weight, stay fit. We're like, no, nah. you still actually need to train so, and lift. So we did a, um, we had a program for the U S military. And so we were brought in to basically implement power athlete training systems with the 18th airborne Corps, which was like 90,000 troops. And one of their stipulations was there had to be like an austere program, which, uh, involved just like water cans, ammo cans, uh, like what they had for their ruck and their, you know, body armor. And so that when they went somewhere that was kind of austere and might not have access to a weight room, they could continue to train. So we had developed this whole program, uh, for a solicitation that we ended up following through, which is unfortunately in the army where all the good programs go to die is in contracting. And so we had this shit sitting on the shelf and all of a sudden this thing launched and I'm like, let's just fucking launch it. Yeah. And we ended up putting out and giving it away for free. And it's still one of our, our programs. Third Great, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was just because we were like, fuck dude, we, we have it. People need it. And, uh, all we're going to get is just a bunch of fucking bullshit body weight, you know, dudes doing weird clapping push ups and fucking, yeah. you know, prison shit. I bet you helped a lot of people out though with that. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I just think like the community aspect, like, I mean, the videos we have are fucking epic. Uh, like dudes training on the stoop of their garage in some like fucking remote basement backyard. And they're just like out there, like with like, you know, 30 to 50 bucks of shit you can buy at Home Depot or, or Lowe's. And, uh, like it was, uh, you know, um, what was it? It was buckets with uh, cement in them. Mm -hmm. I mean, just all the cinder blocks, which weigh anywhere from 30, 30 to yeah. 33 pounds. So, I mean, it's, it, it ended up working out really well. Yeah. And the dudes that did it fucking slayed it. 
Okay. We do people still jump on it for hotel because all you got is fifty pound up to fifty pound dumbbells. So they basically run that program with hotel gym shit. Wow. So it's still it's still got some legs. Uh, p- barring another pandemic, hopefully, hopefully that, I mean, yeah. doesn't happen. Uh, I don't think you can. Um, I, I hope the American people, the age old, like fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on you, kind of deal. Or I don't know if I fucked that one up. I think it's, I, I think it's reversed. But I Just definitely know. Clip and then yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I definitely know if they try that shit again, people are going to be like, eat a dick. Yeah. And uh, it's not going to happen. I mean, uh, at that point, you're going to have people in the streets being like, fucking come on. Yeah. Well, PLL did something cool. Because you, you guys bubble. essentially created a bubble. Yeah, we let's, did a bubble. Let's get into that experience. That was, um, it, it was good and it was bad. Like, I mean. Well, you guys are sponsored by nine alcoholic beers. How bad yeah. could it get? <laughs> I mean, guys came, I don't want to say it was prison, but, um, you know, we were pretty much confined to a hotel room. Like, I mean, we'd go play, you come back, you're testing stuff, and then. You go sit in your room. Like we got on site, you get tested, you got to go sit in your room for 24 hours, that whole, that whole thing. And it was kind of, it was good, but like we got down to the playoffs, we lost to the archers. And I literally, as soon as the game was over, cause they're like, Oh, you need to test. And then, then you can go home. I literally packed my car up and went, cause I was living in Park State, so it was in Utah. I was like, I gotta get the fuck out of here. I'm, I'm losing my mind. And yeah. Drove straight home and I had a couple guys on the team come over. We just drank for like two days and had a good time. And, but yeah, it was, uh, it was fun being there. I'm glad the, P- the PLL did a phenomenal job of getting that together. Cause a lot of sports leagues were scrambling and a lot of sports leagues copied our model of, Lock in, like you know, lock down at a facility and then play sports. NBA, uh, you know, Commissioner Stern and Paul, they talked and their ideas came pretty much from our bubble because we mm. were the first sports league to announce. Did you guys have hookers coming into your bubble? We did not. That was one thing that we asked for with those. Uh, yeah, the NBA guys were sneaking hookers yeah. in. <laughs> yeah, I heard yeah, that. And, and that was then, the Rockets. And then the best <laughs> is that uh, because like these pro hoes now have their own podcasts. And like they, you know, social media and they're trying to like build their clout that like they were like taking pictures and totally outed all these dudes. And then like, I guess like the, like the weed guy like was having trouble getting in. I mean, if you're in the NBA, I mean, you got to smoke your weed. Yeah. But it was, I mean, but it was, it was good. I mean, it, we didn't think we were going to be able to play lacrosse and they put that together for us and we got to compete and I couldn't, I have no, you know, complaints about it other than like it sucked. We couldn't like interact a lot, you know, couldn't go anywhere because obviously everything was locked down. So it was, it was strange, but it was good that we got to compete and people at home got to watch lacrosse. It, that's exactly from a viewer's perspective. I felt like it was very important for the league. Very important. So year one, awesome experience and like the traveling tournaments. I was explaining to John how it worked. And then year two, like you could not do anything. It was yeah. important for the league to continue that day, that year to not sure like, any momentum from year one, we can't lose. Yeah. And then, you know, f- from year one, we, man, we knocked it out of the park with the NBA and NBC TV deal and, you know, the viewership we had on um, all the digital platforms and then just on TV, we crushed it, pandemic hit, and it was kind of just like, eh, and then it just kind of dipped a little bit. Now we're coming back up. We got a lot of good stuff in the works this year. Um, we got the ESPN deal we just signed and every game. Congratulations. Be. Yeah, thank you. And it's going to be on ESPN. Literally, College Across lives on there. Indoor Pro Indoor lives on there. Now pro outdoor lives on there, so it's going to be you know people can just not have to jump from ESPN to NBC. Same announcers, like it's going to be good uh, for that. Uh, how's that going to work for you personally, playing professional and being a college coach? I um, mean- so I have college coaching doesn't interfere with it at all. So um, we play our shit. Our season ends middle of May, so my training camp's next week. So I take off to Albany next week. We got training camp in Albany. We'll be there for a week. Week one's in Albany, so June, so we're there for a week, and then we stay, play that weekend. Yeah, this launches the Friday of the week one. Yeah, yeah. but but what about your off-season training? I mean, like, if you're not training with the kids, then are you out there practicing, or, like, how are you sharpening your skills? I have uh, my trainers here I met in Austin. Um, they do a great job. I've been with them pretty much every day of the week, and then um, I take care of my own stick work skills. I do all that on my own, but at my age, it's kind of like – it's very easy to pick up. It's like riding a bike for me. Yeah, but. if you can't do it now, you probably never be able no, to do it. And the yeah. most important thing for me is the weight room. Like that is the biggest piece for us. If you're not doing that, like guys that get injured, I've been lucky. I haven't been injured in fifth is my fifteenth season. I have not been injured seriously yet. Um, I hope I'm not going to get injured seriously. But I think a lot of that is to do with the trainers that I've had and the workouts that I do. It kind of keeps me out of the off the training table. I think. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And nice. The, uh, I mean, the Ravels have done an awesome job again. This is from an outsider's perspective. What's it like working with them closely and seeing how they've, they've 
taken a hold and had a vision and made it a reality. Yeah. I mean, I remember going to their pitch meetings with them in New York City, um, pitching people for capital. Um, they're two very bright individuals and they had their mindset on starting this pro league. We, you know, we played in the MLL, you know, max salary was 16 grand and we had no health benefits. Uh, with the PLL, we have, I think, league minimums now, 25 grand. And then you have, we get full benefits, you know, health benefits. And every player gets equity in the league, which were the only sports league in the world nice. that gives their players equity, which is a shame because you look at the NFL and, you know, NHL, how much money they make. And it's, the players. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. But also, like, these players that get paid all you see, it's sad to see some players lose all their money, just they mismanage it. But, like, if they had equity in the league, you know, they have something to, you know, yeah, but the owners, um, Won't uh, I've told this story on this podcast before, uh, when I was a rookie in the NFL, uh, Tom Modrak, who since passed away, rest in peace, uh, was our GM and he walked over to me and said, Hey man, uh, you know, like basically you were my draft pick. I'm like if you do well, I do well. We're kind of married in that way. But he also said, man, you'll be successful in the NFL if you forget, if you never forget this. Remember, it's a, a violent game played by violent individuals who get paid a lot of money to do violence on behalf of old rich white men. Never forget this. Jesus. And uh, I was like, okay, fair enough. Like, let's make no illusions. We're not here solving cancer. We're not out here fucking curing heart disease. We're not out here. We're, you know, we're not the little sisters of mercy. We're going to dish it out. Yeah. Regardless of like what they want to do in the NFL and their image problem in this, it's a violent game played by violent individuals who yeah. fucking get paid violent uh, yeah. to, to be violent. And, um, you know, those fucking owners, dude, like, um, what's the NFL team that's going up for sale? Uh, the Broncos. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah dude, did, right. did you see like the numbers? Bit, five like bit, five billions. Babies. So like when Jeffrey Lurie bought the Eagles for like two, 150, it was 150 or 200 million. They fucking said he was insane. And they're, you know, now all of a sudden you have the Denver Broncos going up for $5 billion. Yeah. I mean, just to give you an oh. idea, like, so, so what's wild in the NFL is every team is a nonprofit. It's how they've collectively bargained. 5013C or mm-hmm. are they? Oh yeah. So really? all, I know that. Oh, dude, the NFL structure and how they created it in terms of like not paying taxes and this whole deal and the deal that they cut with the government for collectively bargaining is an absolute fucking genius. Wow. So all the teams, uh, like they all are able to like make money in different ways from like concessions and this and boxes and the whole deal, but then they share TV revenue. So all the players are paid f- from the TV deals. So the owners don't pay the players. The you know the TV revenue is what pays the players. So that doesn't even come out of their pocket. And then they make all this different money in here. And then also the big teams, big cap teams share. I mean, dude, it is fucking genius level of accounting. And then they got it all signed off by the uh, U.S. government to where they don't pay taxes. <laughs> and these owners make fucking money hand over fist. Wow. And uh, we never even got a glimpse until uh, Al Davis had his lawsuit with the NFL about moving. And all of a sudden, this had to be like public record. Dude, it was like uh, amazing, the kickbacks on the kickbacks and the way they were making money. So the fact that an NFL team is selling for that much just gives you a glimpse in how much money they're really making. So what if they pay $5 billion for a team? I mean, are they making $500 million? Are they making a billion? Like, what's the whole deal look like? I mean, they, they want a return on investment. Oh, so yeah. it's uh, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and what's, what's, what's even better is the owners do not open their fucking mouths at all. So, like, they don't know because, like... They don't have to. They don't have to. Yeah. They don't have to. Oh, it's yeah. fucking great. But, they, I mean, Paul and Mike, they just did a great job raising the money, and they had a vision, and they've obviously capitalized on it. I mean, MLL was so piss poor. I mean, the product on the field, when you watch it, was great, but... um, Well, the commercials were awful. Yeah, awful. Really? They oh, my God. What were they? I'll I'll pull some up on YouTube, and you'll just be like, I'm out. Yeah. I hate lacrosse. <laughs> I hate like, everyone. <laughs> Because they just, just didn't, the commercials, and, and they would tell we would tell them, "Hey, we need this. This is missing. This is missing. This is missing." They wouldn't listen to us, and they, Paul was like, "I'm starting my own fucking lacrosse league," and we raised the money and did it, and they folded the year after. Mm-hmm. They, we went. We asked Jim Davis, who owns New Balance, is a, still a, a public or no private company? It's not public. Billion dollar company, shoe company. Sure. Um, and Dad he shoes. He yeah. owned so he owned Major League Lacrosse, and Paul and Mike went in there to buy MLL. You know, I don't know a couple million dollars, and they pretty much told them to fuck off, good luck. And then they ran that year, and they were like, "Okay, we'll sell it to you now." And then sold it to them. I'm sure at a, a discount. At a discount, oh yeah, yeah. Because they came to them, we're like, "Hey, we want you to buy us now." It's like, all right, well, the price tag is this now because we don't we don't need you now because now the reason they wanted to buy them is because we own now we own lacrosse. 
now there's yeah. not two competing leagues and you don't have to yeah. worry about it. But the, t- the team names and the whole approach, like I, I've been to the Final Fours. And yep. in the college Final Fours, John, it's it's Memorial Day weekend. Uh, Saturday basically is the, the two D1 teams. Sunday is uh, D3, D2, and women's championship. I think the women's. Yeah. And then Monday is the, the D1 championship. Mm. But it's like a festival. So it's how they suck you in to so, stay. Yeah. So then they take this model, and every weekend in different cities, which we're going up to Dallas at the end of July, is you a different watch? festival. You guys going to watch? Well, I'm I'll trying. Get, I'll, get you, I'll get you tickets. Thank yeah, you. you guys yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to position our boys up top to connect us for some interviews, some, some stars that they want more personality. I'm trying to tell them, like, hey, this is how you how you win. You become WWE personalities. You get our fan base that are rooting for the dudes. <laughs> that are yeah. dudes. I can get you some. I can get you some. I can get you some interesting guys in here if you want. That's, uh, we'll I, make it happen, uh, dude. I am. Uh, uh, I, I find it really interesting. Um, you know, like uh, I'm a fucking sports snob because I played in the NFL. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't until I met Chris and he keeps yapping on about this fucking lacrosse thing. And then we had Marcus on the podcast. Uh, I watched all of his clips and started watching it. And dude, it's really aesthetically uh, pleasing. Well, it is. Uh, but just dudes moving in space and doing it well and spinning and moving. And it just, it, it, it the pro like, games fun to watch. Yeah. yeah don't come to the high school games. Well, <laughs> no, but, uh, that'll ruin your, that'll ruin but your. It, <laughs> it was, uh, like what I liked was I liked the aggression. I liked that it's this combination of like, okay, you give them a stick. Right, which can be used as a weapon. You got a helmet. Uh, you know, I, I just like I appreciated the sport and the athleticism, and it was fun to watch. Yeah, and it's fast pace. Yeah. You know, which I think uh, the reason the Americans hate soccer so much is it's kind of slow and this and like you know, like uh, it just it's never going to take. No. But then when you go like uh, I uh, years ago, I was a commentator for NFL Europe, and like the NFL fans did not understand NFL football at all. Yeah, and they couldn't fucking understand. They're all it. Premier League fans. And yeah, I mean, them. you know, they're they're out there. They didn't know when to cheer and like the start and the stop and this. And so I think like American like the um, the nature of lacrosse appeals. I think a lot to the American audience. So well, it's I dug it. America's original pastime. Yeah, we call yeah. It, it's called America's. Was it? Um, the, the sport of the future. Wasn't it like line. a Native American sport? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, the indigenous. That's their, you know, they call it the medicine game. They played that. Their fields would be miles and miles and miles and miles long. They'd Was there them. shrooms and peyote involved? I have no idea. Huh. But they have, here we have a couple of Native Americans in our league and hearing them talk about it, it's pretty, pretty eye-opening. They have a good, they, they talk about it all the time. We had a couple of specials on like Lyle Thompson, Jeremy Thompson, the brothers, um, two of the best Native American players in the world, best players in the world. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, just the, if you read into that stuff, the, the you know the medicine game and how they played it and how violent it was, and they played with no pads on, they hit each other in the heads with the sticks, and it's, so it's a warriors game. Warrior nice. mentality is pretty cool. Ridiculous. You'd actually like if you read into that, you'd probably like that playing in the NFL. Yeah, no, I mean I I like violence. <laughs> yeah, uh, like uh, whether it's boxing, I mean. Uh, that's why I hate watching Mayweather fight because he fucking just ducks the <laughs> defense, fucking. Defense, uh, yeah. It's like he never gets hit, and like I I commend him on being the best at fucking evading yeah. and never taking a shot. Uh, there's only a couple times, but yeah, man, I I would like to watch this big dude's fucking clash. Mike Tyson, up. there's Tyson, it's the best. Yeah. yeah, that I mean, growing gr- growing up, he was uh, like our hero. Yeah, the fact that he fucking sprinted out of the out of the uh, locker room, you know, the the towel cut through, yeah. fucking black shorts, no socks, just coming out and fucking strapping dudes up, like yeah. that's the fucking mentality. Yeah, he was. He's. I mean, he's still an animal. <laughs> yeah, you saw that idiot fucking throw a water bottle at him and then fucking what punched the him. F- for, they just and, go, they go to they go to him yeah. into that just for one again social media. They did it to get a social yep. media clip and. And he's what, probably going to get paid for it. No, he's not. No, he's not. Uh, Good. No, uh, they won't file any charges. Good. And uh, everybody's like, "Fuck you! You deserve what you get. Don't fuck with Tyson." Yeah, he's sitting there by himself. Like, yeah. leave him alone. Maybe. You maybe ask him, hey, can I have an autograph? He says, oh. yes, great. If he says no, then Dude, fuck off. I would sit there and be like, man, I am such a fan. Like, sign anything, or more importantly, can I get a picture? Yeah. And, and more then, importantly, he'll like, and he'll do he, it. And he'll do it probably. Yeah. And, and he, he, dude, he gave his time. He was super nice. It wasn't until the dude hit him with a fucking water bottle and tucked shit to him that he got up and fucking gave him a shot. I got a good story. Louisiana, I was down there doing a camp and I went to a shit. I want to say it was a gold gym and Arnold Schwarzenegger was in there. I was, oh. No one, no one was in the gym. It was me, my buddy. And then he has like a, I'd call like a security detail around him. And then over there, I'm like, holy fuck, pumping iron. That's fucking Arnold Schwarzenegger over there. He's yeah. like on pre, I don't know what he was doing, preacher curls or something. Walk over there. And I was just like, hey man, huge fan. Can I, get can I work in? Can I, yeah, no, I didn't say yeah. that. That's what I would have said. I, I would have walked in and been like, hey man, you look like you need a training partner. I volunteer myself. I want to work in. This is a once in a lifetime. 
we heard it when we were at Oktoberfest. We heard Schwarzenegger was there, and if he was there, we would have fucking rushed the stage. Yeah. Yeah. But so I went over to him and asked him, "Hey, can I get a picture? Can I get an autograph?" He said no immediately, and then the security guys like ushered me off. I was like, "Oh, that was interesting." And I got it. I was like, "He's working out. Probably doesn't be bothered." I get it. <laughs> Yeah. And I walked away. I didn't get my phone out. I didn't egg them nah, on. No, I mean, people, people bitch about it. Uh, shit, I, I remember uh, uh, before we built our gym, I was working out at the Gold's Gym. And uh, I saw Jesse James in there, who's our neighbor over here. And I just made a wise-ass comment. I'm like, you're a long way from fucking Long Beach, dude. Yeah. And he was like, and then uh, we realized, uh, you know, I had met him and, and um, we knew a whole bunch of the same people. So, you know, yeah. we've stayed friends. But, uh, yeah, he doesn't work out. Like, he was kind of like, you could see him, like, in there, like, kind of looking around, hoping people, like, hat pulled down. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, yo, man, most people are so fucking into their own uh, like, uh, like can't get out of their own way. I mean, it's, it's pretty disgusting. And like, I periodically have to go work out in a commercial gym just to remind myself how much I fucking how hate poor it. Movement. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Dude, well, just not only the poor movement, but, uh, the amount of people that are trying to like document every aspect oh, of their yeah. fucking workout. Yeah. So they got like a, a magnet tripod. here and this yeah. and a tripod and this. And these guys are like fucking 50 cents of, uh, of like dumbbell bench press and they got their fucking thing set up and they're trying yeah. to do it. And I just want to go by and like fucking stomp on it. Yeah. And I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. If like a, a, you know, if a tree falls in the, in, in, you know, in the woods and nobody's there to hear it, does it really fall? Yeah. Like if a fucking workout happens, you don't document it. Did you really work you out? Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> uh, but that's why we built our gym. Yeah. I like it. Well, I want to get into some, you said outdoor backpack hunting. Yeah. Uh, those are some individuals that John, uh, yeah, right here on this ranch, sniped on this ranch. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, we have, um, uh, we're over 16 acres so I can hunt this property. And then for our wildlife exemption, I have to like kill invasive species. So that big pig, I fucking shot. Oh, you get pigs coming out here? Oh yeah. I got, I got some pictures yeah. I'll show. Dude, I was thermal hunting this weekend. Yeah. Uh, dude, I shot like six of them. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, nice. Well, if and you need helicopter? any help. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I have a place down south I have access to. And then up north, uh, my SF buddies that are up there, they work for like this billionaire. They have like. 11,000 acres and oh, one of my fine. buddies invented a suppressor for a minigun we went up there I'll show you the video we went up there last week and tested the miniguns on top oh, of Humvees it was dude if uh, yeah. uh <laughs> so I um I got a pretty decent uh like infestation yeah and so I have cams set up all over here and then I got thermal and you know suppressors and the whole deal and uh so what I do is I'll lay there and then my phone will buzz and I'll like check it and I just pop out and I fucking. You have the camera that alerts you? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah, it texts me and then I got a, uh, like a PBS 14 and then I got, so I can go out and scan with like a night vision. Yeah, we have. And then I got thermal on the guns. Up north, we use white phosphorus PBS 14s yep. with the IR lasers on them. And then um, yep. this weekend, we used, uh, we just had thermals, pulsar trail, and then something else turned blackout suppressed. Like, yep. yeah, it was. Yeah, no, I've, yeah. I've been using this uh, uh, Q Honey Badger. And then gotcha. I also got a, uh, a mini fix and a fix from Q. Gotcha. And I got those all suppressed set up. With, I got a uh, bunch of custom built guns. We'll, I'll share some yeah. pictures with you. Yeah, the little Envision. I like those. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, on my um, uh, HK416, I got a laser and I'll use that. And that's kind of like if I got to engage multiple targets. But if not, I'll go out and pick them. Yeah. And so they literally just kind of creep around. I get them, pop out of my bedroom, uh, fucking boxer <laughs> shorts, <laughs> fucking shoot them, knock them down, and then drag them out. But um, yeah, those three have taken uh, actually with just within this property. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, I so. had. I'm a big bow hunter. I might do rifle too, but I'm a. I love archery. It's it's yeah. awesome. But I traveled went to New Mexico last year, the Gila National Forest. Nice. Um, got elk down there um, nice. last year. But I mean, hunting is my passion. So when I'm done playing lacrosse, which is probably going to be this year, I'm getting full time into that space. I'm trying to figure out my way in there to you know make a living off of it. I still haven't figured that out yet. But um, hunting is. I'm addicted to it. Yeah. How'd you get into that? Was that a Maryland thing? Uh, my, I used to go hunting and shooting with my uncle, um, but did not really get into it. So I moved to Texas when I was like 23. Um, I moved out here and I started buying up all the guns and I had, I had a lot of good access to ranches and doing it. Um, nice. the big, the biggest hurdle is the access, right? I got a lot of kids like, Hey, how do you go hunting in Texas? A lot of <laughs> land out here is privately owned. Not uh, public. Probably yeah. less than, I think it's one or 2% yeah. is public. It so though it's 3%. Yeah. Public land. Yeah. But I mean, I, I'm sure you've been on leases and guys yeah. farms where shit, like we went out and hunted like 10,000 acres farms. Yeah. And it's it's unreal. Yeah, and we have. I'm just more amazed that people own this shit. It's crazy. Every time I go out there, I'm like, you fucking own this. You yeah. own this much land. The place up north, the eleven thousand acres, they have zebra, ostrich. Oh wow! It's it's fucking insane how many animals they have out there. But they have access. They they ship in access deer. They got access deer out there, and it's it's like hunters. They have six thousand low fence, and they have four thousand high fence. Wow. I know high fence people aren't into that stuff, but 
Well, the, well, pro- the problem is weekend, it's a high fence property, so pigs can't get in or out, but they come through the water gaps. There's freaking pigs everywhere. Well, on, on that everywhere. high fence, dude, they start feeding them all those crazy minerals. And yeah. then you get all these like- Genetics. I, yeah. I like seeing the natural stuff. Yeah. And and you, you can tell as soon as you see it, you're like, oh, that's a high fence fucking- yep. uh, Deer. Uh, People post it and they're like, look at this giant deer. I was like, eh, no, nah, eh, it's not a natural. Yeah. All, all, <laughs> all you did was put fucking peanut butter on the end of your gun and it came over and licked it and you shot it in the face. Yeah. Like, like I mean, that's the joke, right? These guys fucking pay $50,000 to sit that's in a crazy. blind and they put the gun Cage out with peanut there. butter and they come up and fucking shoot it. And the things are so tame because, uh, you know, they don't let anybody in. And these things are just so crazy looking. I see them and I'm like, oh, it looks weird. Yeah, the place down south I go to, I was just there this weekend. They have... Uh, they don't have like giant genetics. They actually look like natural deer, but they bring in the does. Like the does are tagged and they have good genetics. And the, the, the males will meet with the property. So big, like I don't even know if they're in. Where's the property? Tilden, Texas. Okay. So down south. Um, but I go there every year and shoot, shoot deer down there. But, it, you know, like I said, people don't have, I can't go. I don't have access to go to farms all over the place. I have two spots pretty much here and actually three spots I go to here. But. I just take what I can well, get. And- my buddy is uh, has a big property over in Campwood. Gotcha. And uh, we went out there and um, he has all these natural, like, so uh, basically there's access and all these uh, animals that they brought in and then like somebody like either the fence broke or they stopped managing it. And so now they basically just infested the whole area. They can hunt them all year round because they're yeah. invasive species. And then King Ranch, my buddy has access to the King Ranch, which is out of Corpus Christi. It's like 500,000 acres. They have their own security detail on it. Somewhere. And trucks. But they hunt, uh, they yeah. hunt Neil Guy on there. Uh, Neil Guy is like an Indian. It looks like a damn cow shaped picture of one we shot, but they're huge animals. But the meat is like it's unbelievable. You know, uh, <laughs> we've seen. Uh, uh, I saw an odd ad on uh, yep. Route 12, so what's pretty wild oh, is yeah, got out. which which is like be- fa- uh, no, like on the side of the road uh, between Texas House and, and my house here. So I mean, I've seen like a, a small um, axis deer, and we've also seen like what are those little black face, like little mini deer, uh, African. So like they're they're actually pushing this way. Yeah. And uh, I, I can't wait to the day that like all of a sudden on my cam I pick up something like yeah. for, for bow hunt. Like I've only stood in a blind with a gun and waited. Is bow more like active, and you gotta go after things? It depends. I mean, I like the backcountry hunting stuff that, that I do. It's all you know. You're pretty much. It's wherever, all stock. Yeah, yeah, where, yeah, wherever area I get to, I'm up high in elevation, looking, glassing. I have a spotting scope, binoculars. You're literally glassing for like a day or two, and if you spot elk, you gotta make a plan to go. You know, play the wind right. And you gotta go get up within. You know, I'd, I'd like to have anything within sixty yards and under. Um, outside of that, it's getting kind of. Yeah. You gotta hit like a. So we hunted. Uh, <laughs> we hunted um, tule elk. Yeah, in, yeah. in California. Oh, yeah. My, my buddy has eighteen thousand. Can't acres. get tags out there though. <laughs> uh, so my buddy uh, is the third largest private landowner in, in there you California. Go. He's got no people. So he's got eighteen thousand acres, there you and go. so he gets like Land three or tags. four. Yeah. So he gets them, and he sells the landowner because the the tule is like one of like I think like the fifty to to get like the what the, is it? the slam or yeah. whatever. Yeah. yeah. Roosevelt, so, tule. Yep. Rocky Mountain. Yeah. So so these guys wait years for these tags and pay like an exorbitant amount of fee. So uh, we ended up, I traded him a gun and I, I got a, um, uh, a cow tag. Yeah. And so we got there the first day and we wanted to bow hunt them. So we chased those motherfuckers for eight hours. Yeah. Literally like we would hear them. We'd see them. The we would ridge. take running over. They'd be at the next ridge. So after two days of like 16 hours, like full days of chasing this. these things, I was like, fuck this. <laughs> so we, uh, we, we basically, uh, 300 wind mag, Yep. Went out, set up on one deal. Get within it was, side of 800 yards, you're good. I think I was at like 610. Yeah. And that thing's a fucking laser beam. Yeah. And I knocked her down and uh, I was like, oh my God. Like uh, I had this vision. I was going to like take this thing with a bow. It was going to be epic. Yeah. And then I was like, bow hunting's, bow hunting's frustrating. It's a lot of miles on boots, but it's taking an animal with a bow is way better than gun. I mean, I do both. I do gun and I do rifle and bow, but I'd rather bow hunt everything. I mean, it's bow hunting is awesome. I love it. But you you got to get in close for the kill. What's that? You got to get in close. Yeah, and I like because with a gun, I'm so proficient. I could teach you could teach anyone how to shoot a rifle. Um, bow is you're drawing it back, you're holding that weight back there, and you got to like be steady and well, shoot and, it. And, and it's a perishable skill. Yeah. I, I feel like shooting um, is a perishable skill. Yeah, but not nearly as much. As long as I like, uh, you know, I mean, I try to shoot like at least once a week, you know, and sometimes during the summer or even like more coming into it, it'll shoot every night. Yeah, and uh, you know, like. You just become pretty proficient, like point A, like, hey, I know exactly what this thing's doped at. Like, I'm going to hit this thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but with a bow, fuck, there's so many more. Yeah. And especially if you don't, like, shoot with somebody, like, keeping your elbow up or having some yeah. technique stuff. So when we were in Newport Beach uh, over in um, Huntington, there was a really good indoor range. 
and you could go in there and they would have people and you'd be like, Hey, just watch me. Like, we, you know, help me clean it up and you could book some time and dude, it was so. You got plenty of space out here for 3D. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> there's a little pasture behind this that I want to set up yeah. 3D on. And I have, I shoot every morning. So you look at my Instagram, I'll shoot this morning, but I shoot like 10 hours a morning just with my coffee. I just like it. That therapeutic. I just love shooting and. Nice. Yeah. Where, uh, where do you live at? Um, Westgate. So that's um, Manchaca, Lamar. Okay. Um, it's pretty much like five miles from campus okay. right there. Yeah. So, Sweet. yeah. I want land though. I want to get the hell out of the city. I don't want to be here looking at Wyoming, Park City. Oh, I get it. Love those areas. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, when, when we. Austin's not bad. This is a great setup you have. So, yeah. We're, we're uh, so five years ago, this was the country. Yep. And now it's not the country anymore. Yeah. I mean, they built thousands just of gonna homes. Keep going. Yeah, they're just going to well, keep and, going. Well, and I mean, but we're 16 acres. Yeah. And so, like, we're kind of in this little alcove. And then our, our neighbor has, uh, 12 because they're the horse school and then my other neighbors got a bunch. So we we have this kind of like little alcove and um, they're just building these homes. And I guess what will happen is at some point the land will be too valuable. And I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure you said you bought it in 2016. I'm sure the value has gone way up. Yeah, we, we did well. Like we couldn't even, we couldn't even touch the land for what we paid for this entire place. Uh, I bet you it's 10 X what you got it at. Yeah. 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 Not 10, but pretty damn close. Pretty close. You hold on to it. I'm sure the more they build, well, it's going to just keep going. Yeah. Well, what's good is uh, because we have uh, wildlife exemption, yeah. uh, our property taxes are super low. Oh, nice. Yeah. Because so with the horses and everything, you got livestock? Or? Uh, well, we originally had, uh, so when the, we bought the property, that guy had wildlife. So he converted from ag into wildlife. Gotcha. So we're actually, uh, because Little Barton Creek runs through our property and we own both sides. So from the, the front of the property, we have over a quarter mile of Little Barton Creek and it starts about 50 yards from our property line, it comes out of the ground. Wow. And so, uh, because of that, we, um, and we're like, you know, whatever it is, we got, uh, what are they? We're a bird sanctuary. Oh, wow. So because of the bird sanctuary, we, uh, got a uh, wildlife exemption. So we only pay taxes on the one acre we live on. That's and then awesome. all this other stuff's like two bucks. That's awesome. Uh, so you said training camp coming up like week long. What is that? What is that experience like? That's going to be, we all get on site next week. We'll do our physicals. Day one, I don't know what's going on with the COVID stuff. I don't know if they're going to be still testing for that, but uh, that was a nightmare. Um, I'm only one of like three players not vaccinated, so we had a bunch of different rules for ourselves outside of that. Have you ever I, had COVID? Did you have it? I've had it twice. Yeah, twice. Wow. Yeah, I had the Delta. I got the, the OG, the first one. Was sick for maybe 24 hours. I my the flu I got and was worse than that. And then the Delta was it the second one. Is that? That's know. the one that had your penis fall off, Yeah, right? my, my penis fell off. Yeah. No, I was supposed to go to a vacation with my girlfriend over New Year's, and I got it, and I went hunting for four days down south because I obviously can't be around people. Yeah. And then the CDC changed it from 10 days to four days, and I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm good. Didn't even get sick. Like, first time I know I had it. it How'd you know you got it? Did you go get tested? Taste and smell. The first uh, time. Lost my taste and smell. I was like, <sighs> had my nose in an alcohol bottle. I was like, can't smell this. I definitely have COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Or, so, or it could be cedar fever. Yeah, could be. Yeah, it could have been cedar fever. Or it could be a cold. Or it could be a cold. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know what the I don't know what those I don't know what that's going to look like. But um, we'll get there, do all that stuff, take care of it, and then we're pretty much competing for positions. And um, you know, we think twenty three roster spots. We'll probably have 28, 30 guys there. And then um, what's will, the average age? Shit, twenty twenty five. I'm the oldest. So you're a little long in the tooth. Huh? I'm the oldest. Uh, no, Brody, Brody Merrill's 40. So I, I'm 36. I'm the second oldest in the league right now. Yeah. You're like, uh, you're like looking at these kids. You're like, man, if I had a mistake in high school, you'd all be my kids. Kid I coached, kid I coached against in high school in Dallas, Nakai in Montgomery. So I coached against him, watched him play in college. We just drafted him on the team. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah. <laughs> coached uh, against what, him in high school and now he's playing pro with me. So that's yeah. pretty cool. Well, it's like Tom Brady. Yeah. Uh, Tom Brady's, uh, first there, there's a kid that, uh, who, who was it? The Tampa drafted. That wasn't alive when Tom Brady first came in the NFL. That's wild. So how wild is that? That's You're like, yeah, well, I'm fucking, you've been playing in the NFL longer than I've been alive. That's yeah, pretty cool. Fucking great. Yeah. I love it. Call me dad. <laughs> yeah. The uh, Fuck. Well, shit, man. Uh, well, I mean, we we know Marcus is on the Archers. Yes. So we didn't explain your team. Who can people root for? Like, where do we direct them to give some some power athlete love your way? Um, I'd say, you know, Redwoods, obviously – Follow me, but um, for our young stars, I mean, you got Miles Jones, uh, big midfielder. He's pretty much an NFL player with a stick. He's huge, athletic. Um, he had an unbelievable season last year in the assist department. He likes to dodge. He's got great vision, um, likes to share the rock. So look for Miles this year. Rob Pinnell, still one of the greatest attackmen um, in the league at end of all time. Um, so he look for him down at the attack position. Um, Eddie Glazner, Garrett Apple, defenseman. 
And then you got a local boy here, Tim Timmy Troutner in net. I think he's probably next Team USA. I think he's definitely a front runner for that position. Him and Blaze Reardon, they're the two best goalies in our league. And, um, you know, obviously Timmy's a young, bright star. And he's uh, looking out for those guys this year, for sure. And TD Ireland, best face-off guy in the league, yeah. I think. How, next to Trevor uh, Baptiste. How do the teams work? Like, are they actually like kind of like in the NFL and everything else where it's like a team is associated with like a certain town? No, sir. It's pretty much like the MMA and NASCAR. We travel, the travel show every weekend. And they're clubs. So Redwoods Lacrosse Club, mm. Atlas Lacrosse Club. There's no city model we're trying to we're just touring right now mm -hmm. i think the end goal is to we get asked that question all the time the end goal is to sell it um to city-based have people buy them up in cities and then go that model but right now i think it's good because we drop into an area like dallas we sell it out it's great we go to another area we don't get many fans we'll just pick it up we'll go somewhere else and because nice. you get locked to a city and no one shows up yeah you're fucked <laughs> yeah and it, yeah no i mean it, it's a great model yeah well so. and grows the sport sure yeah so that's what's cool is way, way west. The effort out there. That's cool. You guys go with the we're west in Seattle. coast. Yeah, we're in Seattle this year. I think we're in California. Um, Seattle, Utah, here. Yeah. So trying to go, trying to hit every city. Bring support to everyone. Sweet. Nice. Yeah. Well, where where can people go to follow you personally in your journey in this? Um, follow, um, follow me on Instagram at khartso 81 My company at Defensive Academy. I'm shut down on Instagram right now. Should be back up hopefully next week. What happened to me, dick pics? <laughs> no, they, no, they, He's like, I was DMing dick pics uh, to kids. Uh, this I new gotta, NIL thing is real weird. I logged into it and then they said, oh, you might be too young and we're reviewing the account. So I had to oh. appeal it. They, they did this new thing with the ages. They, they did that to my uh, uh, to my wife's and account. And I fucking hated it. So I went on there and just lied about my age. It's like, fuck you. I don't want to give you my birthday. And then like I put something in there and it made me 13 years old. And they're like, oh, you're too young. I was like, no, 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 no. This is what I did. Please give me my account back. So I did that. And then, uh, you know, UT Lacrosse. Follow me, UT Lacrosse. But yeah, my defensive academy stuff. I travel all over the country doing clinics for kids, teaching the position. And me, Marcus, and our buddy Scotty Rogers are doing a little Texas tour this weekend. So. Sweet. Oh, yeah. Just pulling up the week one schedule because this drops Friday. So Saturday. This Friday Sunday. or next Friday? Uh, week one Friday, so June. Yeah. In Albany, New York. Know. I don't know. That's probably pretty bad. I don't know who we play. It doesn't matter who we play. Just fucking let him show <laughs> up. It doesn't matter. <laughs> fucking beat the shit out of Marcus. Yeah, if you guys want to come to Dallas, so let me know. I'll get you guys tickets. Leave a yeah. roll call for you. Yeah. Count us in. Well, what about Marcus's hair? I mean, you know, with, with the flow. The, yeah, the, the flow. Yeah, fucking, fucking bounce. Yeah. <sighs> this guy with the all ball this he, he I'm not. I'm not a stud. I don't. They all dye their sticks and stuff. I'm pretty old school. I get all these kids like, "Hey, can I dye your sticks for the season?" I'm like, "Dye them with I, what?" They like dye them, and they're pretty crazy. Like these kids, uh, like airbrush and those wild shit. Yeah, these little kids are creative, man. They'll take your heads, so we'll ship them the heads, and they'll design them to our teams, like colors, logos, and they'll string them, color coordinate them, and then they'll you just post them on Instagram for them. But they make. I mean, they gotta be making a lot of money doing that. All right, so y'all lead off the entire season. So Redwoods Atlas on ESPN Plus. June 4th, 2.15 p.m. Eastern. Yep. And then on the ESPN, the one, the Ocho, 5 p.m. Whip Snakes and Chaos. That would so be the Saturday. rematch of the championship game last year. Yes. Yep. Sweet. And then all summer long, right? All summer long on ESPN. All right, Power Athlete Nation, thank you very much for tuning in to another episode of the Premier Podcast and Strength and Conditioning. Ping. Power Athlete Radio. Bye. Thanks, dude. Bye. <laughs>